Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's live webinar. We will be starting the presentation in just a couple of minutes. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lauren Childs, and I'll be your moderator. If at any point you have a question, please use the question and answer box you see on your screen. I wanted to simply let you all know some key information before we start in on the main event. First is that this entire webinar will be recorded, so if you have to leave early or anything comes up, you will be able to gain access to it after the event. Also, you'll see in the left-hand corner of the screen you're looking at is a printable version of the PowerPoint. So again, you can watch this presentation again, you can print it out, take notes, any of, their, any of that is there for you for future use. The other part is that this is the first part of an ongoing series with Ingram Spark. So we'd really love it if you can come back. Um, our next one will be in April and it will be covering all the major kinds of topics you would want for a an indie publisher who is trying to get their book out into the marketplace. So please feel free to join our newsletter mailing list and we'll be sure to send out all the information there as well as on social and any other place you could possibly get information from us. The last bit of information I want to give you all is that we'll be hosting a giveaway at the end of today's presentation and it will be just a short little fun answer and question and that will be hinted at during today's presentation. So if you stay tuned, you'll be sure to have the answer and the first 10 to respond will get a very special prize. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce to you Robin Cutler. She's the Senior Manager for our Ingram Spark and our very special guest today is Cynthia Frank, who is the President of Cypress House. So, uh, hi, this is Robin. Uh, you know it's me because I sound like I'm a hick from the South. Um, uh, but uh, And then Cynthia, comparison. Cynthia, do you want to say hello? Well, hello, folks. I'm calling in from, from the left coast. <laughs> and uh, Cynthia's got a very sweet, uh, comforting voice in comparison to sort of my southern drawl. So that's how you will know uh, which one of us is speaking. Um, as um, Cynthia, as uh, Lauren said, uh, both um, myself and Cynthia will be presenting uh, the webinar today. And here's uh, a picture of us so you can see, um, it combined the, the face with the voice. What we're going to be covering today um, is um, I want to sort of start off and very briefly kind of walk you through Ingram, what Ingram does, um, uh, introduce you to Ingram Spark if you're a, a new customer and maybe not even a Spark customer to give you some background on what Ingram Spark is and what it does. And then I want to um, really spend the better part of the webinar today uh, with Cynthia's part since she's our very special guest today where she's going to be talking to you specifically about uh, how you're going to be working with booksellers, the chain stores, the independent stores, and online stores. And uh, Cynthia is a, a great resource 
um, and uh, one of the industry leaders as far as this topic. So we're really happy to have her here with us today. So the uh, first question that is uh, that I want to just briefly talk about is to kind of talk about what Ingram is. Um, and this little graphic here really kind of shows it. Ingram is what I call the center hub uh, of sort of the publishing world. So it's we're the, the middleman uh, between publishers and their content and then retailers uh, who we sell uh, publishers' content to. Currently, we work with more than 30,000 pub uh, publisher partners around the world. We have more than uh, 13 million titles in the Ingram catalog, and then we distribute that content to over 39 retail partners around the world. So Ingram uh, is very friendly with our publisher partners and also our retail partners. <clears throat> So Ingram, uh, when we talk about Ingram, it's, it's big numbers. We, Ingram is the largest book distributor, wholesaler in the world, uh, and all of our services are global. Um, Ingram has been around for about 50 years. Uh, it is a family-owned business. It's still owned by the Ingram Company. We're based uh, in the Nashville area in Tennessee. Um, and like I said, we uh, distribute to over 39,000 retailers in over 20, 220 countries around the world. We also are the leader in ebook and e-content distribution, and we distribute to over 80 online retailers, including Amazon Kindle, um, Barnes and Noble, and uh, retailers such as that. So when we're talking about Ingram, we're talking about our reach within the, the book industry. Currently, we sell content to both global and regional chain bookstores, to independent retailers, uh, to university bookstores, to internet retailers, to gift retailers, specialty, museum shops, and uh, school and public libraries. And then online, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, we distribute to over 80 online retailers, uh, the big ones that you know, Amazon Kindle, uh, Apple iBooks, Barnes & Noble Nook, and Kobo are the four big ones. Um, this is sort of a screenshot of uh, what you're seeing now is a screenshot of Ingram Spark, uh, the, the home page. And as you can see in the Ingram Spark world, everybody's really happy and uh, it's just a wonderful experience. Uh, but I just wanted to give you this graphic just to so uh, when you do come to the Ingram Spark site, you'll, you'll kind of know what it looks like. Uh, one of the best things about Spark is we do um, – uh, consistently and regularly feature our own publishing um, customers on the site itself. And, and this person that you see in the graphic is actually an IngramSpark customer. And this is actually her comment about using IngramSpark. So what, what we've done with IngramSpark is we've combined uh, the print POD uh, Services that we have available through our company, Lightning Source. Some of you may be familiar with Lightning Source. It's actually an Ingram company. It's been around now for, you know, almost 20 years. Uh, and another part of our business that you may be less familiar with is our ebook distribution platform called, called CoreSource. So what we've done with Ingram Spark is we've combined. Uh, both our print-on-demand and our e-distribution, as well as Ingram distribution all together. We uh, have provided both this print and e-book service. Uh, we um, have redesigned the, the user interface specifically with indie authors and publishers in mind. And, uh, and, we've, and, and you see here the, the different uh, reasons why um, you know, it's a good idea to use uh, Ingram Spark. What it costs to set up a title in Ingram Spark is uh, $49 to set up your title for both print and e distribution. 
uh, you can set up a print title only or you can set up an ebook title uh, that's going to cost $25. And, and that really nominal fee will give you global distribution, as broad as you can get it. <clears throat> what you'll also need when you set up your title in Ingram Spark is all the metadata, which is just a fancy word for information uh, about your book. You'll need to be able to provide uh, the, the metadata associated with the title and author, uh, BISAC codes, which are also subject categories uh, that uh, will, you know, put your book in the proper catalog, uh, category that, uh, that retailers will need to find it. Uh, you'll need a good description of your book. You will need ISBNs uh, for all the books that you plan to distribute through Ingram Spark. You are able in Ingram Spark to set up a title just to have it printed. Uh, and not distributed. If you want to use uh, Ingram Spark as just your printer, you can do that. And in that case, uh, we will assign like a, a non-distributed SKU to your book. So if you, if you don't have ISBNs and you only want to print, you can use us for that. Um, and then uh, you will provide the pricing for us to sell uh, in global markets around the world. Uh, and then you'll also be providing the print attributes of your book. That means uh, the trim size, if it's a print book, the trim size, the number of pages, whether or not it's going to be in color or black and white on the interior, all those things that, uh, that allow us to print a book. You will be providing discount uh, information. Cynthia is going to be talking a little bit more about this in her part of the presentation, but in Ingram Spark, you can set a wholesale discount anywhere between 30 and 55 percent of the list price on your book. On the ebook side, uh, it's a 60 percent discount. And then you also have the choice in Ingram Spark to set up three different returnability options. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that in Cynthia's part. So as I said before, we distribute to retailers, libraries, and how it works is when your title is set up for distribution in Ingram Spark, the title actually goes out into Ingram's data catalogs. Um, you can choose to actually uh, purchase an ad or announcement for your book in, in some of those uh, catalogs. And then uh, the retail partners will actually place the order for your book through Ingram. And Ingram uses, if it's a print book, uses print-on-demand through Lightning Source to actually manufacture your book. And then we deliver the print and the ebook content directly to the retailer and then pay you for the sale based on the discount that you've set up on your title. Uh, we pay you based on the discount. So the formula is basically list price minus discount minus the print fee, and, and what's left is the net of what you will receive on the sale of that book. On ebook orders, uh, we just pay you the list price minus the discount. And then again, on um, publisher direct orders, which are orders that you can place yourself uh, and then have us uh, drop ship those orders directly to your customers, on those orders you're just paying print fees. You're not paying any discount and you pay the shipping and print fees, and then we ship it directly to your customer. And that, that's a great service. It uh, takes out the burden of you having to warehouse or you know, doing any fulfillment on your end. Uh, we'll, we'll do all of that for you. Um, and, and on this last slide, uh, I just want to kind of reiterate, and I know Cynthia is going to talk a little bit about best practices uh, when you're working in Ingram Spark or you're setting up your title for distribution really in any system, um, I feel like it's best practices to always own your ISVN on your book. It's almost like owning your name. Um, and uh, why you want to do that is because the ISVN will travel with the book uh, through the life of the book and is available, you know, would, would uh, be available on, you know, multiple sites. 
if, you, if you're using a free ISBN from some of these services, you're kind of tied to wherever you're purchasing or getting that free or very cheap ISBN. You want to own and, and pay uh, and invest in the ISBN uh, on the front end. Um, <clears throat> one of the things uh, we're going to talk about and maybe debate a little bit with Cynthia is about formats. So I, I personally believe you should set up your book in as many formats as you can afford to do. Um, and the reason I say that is because you don't know what readers prefer uh, in terms of formats. You don't know if they would rather purchase a paperback, a hardback, or an e-book. So the best, um, and the best way to set up your book for success is to make it available in as many formats as possible. Um, I believe that it's a good idea to use print-on-demand to test the demand of your book. Uh, you, can, you can set your book up. If your book takes off, um, you know, you can always publish and print traditionally. Um, but uh, you can use POD to test the market, and it, it makes the investment to bring a book to market really minimal. Um, I also think that you don't know where, how your readers prefer to purchase. So you don't know if they, want, you know, if they shop on Amazon or if they have, uh, you know, some reason why they don't want to shop on Amazon. Maybe they prefer to purchase, you know, from a, their local bookseller. Uh, you don't know, so make your book available as widely as possible to allow for that. And along with that, I really believe it's uh, a goal for all of us to support our local booksellers and. Libraries, to me, indie publishers and indie booksellers kind of go hand in hand. So I think it's really important that you get to know your local bookseller and library and uh, use them as a resource uh, when you're bringing your book to market. Great. Thank so you. So at this juncture, yeah, at this juncture, I'm going to turn over the presentation to uh, Cynthia and uh, take it away, Cynthia. Okay. Well, there's. I agree with almost everything that Robin said. The the only thing that I would debate, I guess, is the word that she used, is about offering in paperback, hardback, and ebook. E I would suggest that you do as much market research and number crunching beforehand, so that you are as educated as possible. And one of the things that you need to know is what books your particular title will be rubbing shoulders with, either on the virtual shelf online or in a brick-and-mortar store. And you need to know not just who that end buyer reader is, but who all of the referrers, which might be a librarian or a school teacher, or the choosers, which might be a grandparent or a parent or a counselor, all of those other folks are who are going to enable your book to get into the hands of that of that end reader. Some books will live their best life as a paperback, some as a hardback, some will start out as a hardback, then go to paperback, then go to ebook. Uh, so I would just encourage you to do as much pre-production research as possible. And if you're working with, with Ingram Spark, they have a really easy online interface, and you can go online and check out what the format sizes are that they use and what kind of text paper they use, what the costs are for a black ink only interior or a color interior. Crunch those numbers. Um, make sure that if you have the vision of working with Spark, that you are designing a book that is compliant with the specifications that they use. Uh, POD printing basically has more limitations than if you were going to an offset printer where you could do slightly unusual sizes or unusual kinds of bindings. There are some limitations there. So as you design and create your books, you want to make sure that they'll be press ready. You don't want any nasty surprises getting toward the end. I am in complete agreement with Robin about owning your own ISBN. And to buy your ISBN number, single number, or logbook, one goes to myidentifiers.com. And, and
an ISBN number is the identifying number for, for a particular title in a particular binding. So a paperback copy of a, a novel will have one ISBN number. The hardcover edition of that same book will have a different ISBN number. And the EPUB form of the ebook will have a third number. So if you plan multiple titles or multiple formats, I would suggest you get at least a 10 number ISBN logbook. In general, the, the ISBN numbers are 13 digits long. Nowadays, they're starting with 978. Most times, we will see the next digit be a 0 or a 1, which I understand is a designator that the book was published in an English-speaking country. The next group of digits is the identifying number for your publishing company. That's one reason it's important. You don't want to buy something um, for cheap or get it for free. And then if someone is looking for you, say they want to do subsidiary rights, they want to package your book as a gift book, they want to do a Korean translation, and they're led to this other publisher or this other company because they're the holder of those ISBN numbers. So it just gives you more connection and control and visibility in the marketplace. So when we're making books, I, I love slide four from what, from what Robin was, was using, because it clearly shows the retailers and Ingram, and it shows the position in the marketplace. So everybody's got to make a living in this business. So the publisher sells the book to Ingram at a discount, and then Ingram sells the book at a discount to the retailers. Now the retailers might be Barnes & Noble, it might be an independent store, it might be a library, it might be Amazon.com. And then that retailer sells the book to the end viewer or they put it on their library shelf. So what the bookstores expect in general from Ingram, from the wholesaler, is a 40% discount. So if you set up your book with Ingram, at just that 40% discount, Ingram's not going to make any, any money on that. They, they're not going to be able to offer the 40% discount to the bookstore. So if you want your book to flow easily into independent bookstores, then I would encourage you to consider the 55% discount and full returnability. The book industry is a returnable industry. I think this got started during the Depression when publishers had lots of books and bookstores had no books, but they didn't have a whole lot of capital either. So they made a, a, a gentleman's agreement, so to speak, so that they could put books onto the bookstore shelves. The bookstore could pay um, and, or, or return the books if they didn't sell and, and get a credit on that. So I, I've done a number of interviews with booksellers across the country. And um, basically what they are telling me is that they want to be about 90% sure that they can sell that book before they buy it from a wholesaler, before they buy it from Ingram. So that means that you have to be giving the bookstore a quality product, something that, that stands out qualitatively and fits in beautifully genre-wise. So it needs to be easily shelved by the bookstore or by the library. We don't want something that looks so unusual or sounds so unusual that no one knows where to put it. So if you have the idea that your book is completely unique and there is nothing like it out there in the universe, you need to visit a lot of, of stores and libraries and go online and figure out what people will be looking for when they discover your book. There were more than, I think, 300 and some odd thousand titles published in the United States alone last year. And so, what is that, more than 800 books a day 
they have to figure out some way that people are going to actually discover your book. And if your book is uh, labeled or packaged so uniquely that the bookstore doesn't know where to put it on the shelf, then you're just creating difficulty for yourself. We want to make sure that your book has an appropriate retail price. There are some books that are, are more manuals and textbooks where you won't be printing very many, or there is such as a specific demand for them. They're, they're what some people call a destination book, and you can charge a premium price for them. There are others that might be more mind candy or fluff or impulse buy, and those would have a lower price. This is where your market research comes in. You want your book to fit into its category and stand out qualitatively and not be um, not so that the, the end buyer doesn't end up with sticker shock. Oh, it, it, all these other textbooks are $48.95, and here's one that's $9.95. Huh, it might not be very good. So make sure you know what all of those other titles are next to yours are going to be on the shelf. Another marketing issue there is some of those people might write blurbs or endorsements or reviews of your book. You might be able to do a presentation or an author event with some of them. So there, there's lots of other things that can happen with the titles that are next to yours on the shelf. What booksellers are looking for is what kind of publisher author support they're going to get for the sell-through. There are thousands of stores and outlets in this country. And what is going to draw an individual to the store to look for that particular book is going to be very important. Now, you might have more luck locally and regionally. Um, some local stores will just want to buy from you on a consignment basis because that might be easier for them. Um, some of them might want to do an, an event first. They might want to test the waters. But having your book available via Spark will be of great comfort to them, especially if you're the type of author who goes out on the road and you're not always available to, to supply them with books. But they want to know what you are going to, what kind of buzz you're going to generate to help get sell-through. Um, one of the authors I work with thinks, says she thinks of bookstores like restaurants. Um, she's a cookbook author herself, so I, I see where that comes from. But she says, you know, if you have a small restaurant, you have to keep turning those tables during your dinner service so that you're making enough money. So you can't just park a book in a bookstore. It needs to be sold. It needs to move on into its life. So then we get to some of the some of the things that the bookstore will see when your book is is loaded into Spark. It appears on what is called iPage, which is the bookseller's interface with the Ingram inventory. So they'll see the front cover of your book. They'll get brief bibliographic and marketing information. If you've gotten some major reviews or awards, that information will be there as well. And it will show what they call a virtual quantity in um, two of the four Ingram warehouses. Um, in actual fact, when a bookstore places an order, that's when the print-on-demand system makes the book and ships it to the store. So there's an example here. This is what the bookseller sees on iPage for your particular book. This is a, a publisher that, that I've worked with for, for many years. And so you can see where it says um, DC, which I believe stands for Distribution Center. So there's this view is showing the Tennessee and the Indiana warehouses. Um, if we were actually online and this weren't just a slide, we would see what happens when you hit the show more, and you would see the other two warehouses. Ingram has four warehouses. So, oops, I accidentally hit the, the wrong button there. I need to go back to this view here. So you can see down here under in additional information where it says BISAC categories. That's very important. The BISAC categories... Um, help 
librarians and booksellers know where to place the book in a store. It helps librarians build depth and breadth in a collection. If you want to figure out an accurate BISAC category for your book, which is most often put on the back upper left-hand corner of your cover, then you would go to bisg.org and take a look at the different BISAC categories. Years ago, when you walked into an independent store, each store would shelve according to what they felt like. They made up their own categories. In the last, I would say, six or seven years, the book industry study group, which handles the BISAC categories, has been working with the book industry to uh, codify those shelving categories in order to help everyone out and help readers, librarians, booksellers really locate books and build the breadth and depth in their various collections. So when you're selling to, indi to individual stores, this is in, in important information to have. So if you meet with your local regional store, you walk into a store when you're on vacation or on a business trip, and you're working with Spark, you can tell them, my book is available via Ingram. And then they can happily go there and, and, and buy the book. Underneath the copyright date here on this page where it says this item is returnable, that's what they will see if you have done a 55% discount and marked the book as returnable. Um, if you have done what they call a short discount, less than a 55% discount in your setup with Ingram Spark, then another kind of line will appear here showing what the discount is rather than the expected 40% discount. Okay, so then when we get into talking about Barnes & Noble, a lovely chain bookstore, um, they have a couple of different ways that you can work with them. You can work with them via their online distribution centers, which, which feeds their, their, their website. Um, or you can do a new title submission to them in hopes that the category buyer will fall in love with the book and buy the, the physical book for placement across their system. One of the goals might be what's called modeling. So we, one of our, our own novels, The Last Aloha, we're about to go into our eighth printing, and it's now modeled in about 60 different Barnes & Noble stores across the country. Because it's a book on Hawaiian history, it's modeled in many of the stores in what are called the gateway cities, where, where many people um, leave via plane to go to Hawaii for vacation, because that's how that particular title has proven itself in the Barnes & Noble system. So the book is modeled at a depth of two, I think they go as high as five, which means that for those 60 stores, they always have two copies. And any time one copy is bought, the system automatically orders another. Now, in order to get into the brick-and-mortar stores in the first place, it has to be available from a preferred wholesaler. Barnes & Noble has a list of preferred wholesalers, and Ingram is at the top of that list. It has to be returnable. It has to be a quality product with an appropriate retail price, and they have to know what your marketing plan is, what kind of publisher and author support of sell-through is going to happen. Now, sometimes you might see a special promotion at a Barnes & Noble store with uh, a certain title stacked high in a, on a front table or on an end cap. That is something that the category buyer might offer to a publisher as an option if they have fallen in love with the book. It can get a bit pricey. They don't publicize what those charges are. Um, but it can be of, of, of great assistance to a title. So um, I think after the presentation, we're going to, to be able to send you all a, a list of links. And I will include in there the, the new title submission form link 
for Barnes & Noble and some various other things so that you know exactly what to do. In my interviews with Barnes & Noble staff in the buying department in New York, one of the things that they have stressed to me over the years is the, important, the importance of seeing endorsements, even if it's a prepub that they are receiving or early news of a title. Endorsements show that the author and the publisher know what they're about and know that they need to work all avenues for getting the book noticed and for getting sell-through. So they require availability from a preferred wholesaler. They require that returnability plus all of the quality, the same as the independent, the regular independent stores, the non-chain stores. Now, I think Robin's going to join us for a little bit here in our, our discussion of Ingram and Spark and Advantage and Create Space and all of that. So do you want to weigh in first, Robin? Sure, I'm back on here. Um, and, and in full disclosure um, to our audience here is um, prior to coming to Ingram, I did work for Amazon and CreateSpace. Um, and so I, I'm uh, very well versed in the CreateSpace system and uh, can, you know, help kind of uh, work through, you know, how Ingram and, uh, and Spark in particular and CreateSpace kind of, kind of work happily side by side. So um, do you want to, so, well, well, the first bullet here, Ingram and Spark. So any print title that you've made available to, um, that you've made available for distribution at Ingram Spark automatically uh, gets sent to Ingram um, to get listed in Ingram's catalog as well as to Amazon. Um, and in terms of Amazon Advantage, do you want to talk a little bit about how that works in Amazon? Sure, sure. Okay. This is this is a way that um, a little press, a small press, an indie press can set up a direct relationship with Advantage. Now, the Advantage, as far as I'm concerned, is all Amazon's <coughs> because what they ask the small press publisher to do is give them a 55% discount and returnability. So they're asking the publisher to treat them as a wholesaler. So 55% discount, returnable, and the publisher pays the freight on the books going to Amazon. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and the other thing is that uh, you will get constant reorders. Like they only stock, you know, a handful of books. And so when they deplete you know, that inventory in the Advantage Warehouse, they're, they're going to be sending you orders to, um, to replenish, you know, those orders. So there's a constant uh, expense of the shipping, you know, back and forth on right. that inventory. And, and now that Amazon has more than 40 warehouses all across the country, the orders that you get, you might get an order for 25 copies but they might be going to 25 individual warehouses. And that mm -hmm. kind of shipping cost can really add up. Now, if you got that kind of a direct order from an independent store, it would be a 40% discount, and the store would be expecting to pay the freight. That's one reason why they like to order from Ingram, because they can get the 40% discount, and they can consolidate orders for hundreds and hundreds of titles into into one freight order. And I think depending on their relationship with, with Ingram, depending on how, how much they order, they might also be able to get a freight discount or free freight. Yeah, that's right. And then in terms of setting up a book, uh, and CreateSpace, as some of you probably know, is uh, basically Amazon's print-on-demand company. Uh, it's it's uh, similar in a lot of ways to Lightning Source. It's um, uh, Lightning Source offers certainly, and through Ingram Sparks Lightning Source program, we offer a lot more um, print options than you get on CreateSpace. But CreateSpace does a, a really nice job, especially on the paperback. So if your book is listed with CreateSpace, uh, it's automatically going to be sent uh, to Amazon, um, as well as like if if it's listed uh, the same with Ingram Spark. Uh, where uh, there's a little bit of an issue is CreateSpace allows you, when you're setting up your title, to uh, opt in to their expanded distribution program, which is essentially Ingram. 
So it it will if you opt in to create spaces expanded distribution, it will put the book into um, the Ingram catalog, um, but it won't be at uh, at a discount that's advantageous for when it goes out to uh, independent bookstores and uh, chain stores to order. I think it will show up as even a 25% discount. I think, um, that, I so, think that's right, yeah. Yeah, so the expanded distribution, uh, it will get you broad distribution, but it's not actually, uh, you know, probably advantageous for you. You you can set up your book, your paperback book, in both Ingram Spark and CreateSpace, not opt in to uh, the expanded distribution, use the same ISBN in both systems, and they actually live pretty happily side by side. Uh, yeah, Amazon, I've, seen, I've seen that work well. Yeah, and Amazon, you know, sort of figures it out. Amazon always knows where it can source a product from, book product from, and uh, and will usually make the decision of where to purchase, you know, based on how quickly they can get the content to the end consumer who's purchased your book. So, um, so it's not a bad thing. In fact, I think it's an advantageous thing to set up your book uh, for both CreateSpace and Ingram Spark, as long as you don't opt in to expand the distribution. Right, and as long as you're using your own ISBN number, your own publishing company information, especially if you're planning on taking any books printed by any POD printer into an independent store to make a presentation, you don't want your presentation to smack of Amazon, which is one of their prime competitors. Yeah, and um, and so Cynthia, I just want to give you the high five here that um, we're we're kind of running out of time here. So okay, uh, I'll be quick. You've got a really great yeah, you've got a really great <laughs> slide coming up. So I want you to spend a little time on that. Okay, so does your book have the right stuff? So before you go to press, make sure your book is well organized and edited. If you have written a novel and even if you're on your 87th draft, make sure other people's eyes see it and go over it before it is typeset. At a certain point, we all become blind to things. Even the best, most professional authors need to have another pair of eyes. If you, you, are, if you are a novice writer, if you are just starting out, workshop your book, hire a professional editor, uh, there's no licensing out there for editors. And, and what we often suggest is get a free sample edit. Make sure that you have some rapport with your editor because you're going to be, they're going to be intimately involved with all of your words and you want to make sure that you're setting forth along, along the same path. If you've written a technical kind of a book, your book might need a style sheet. Our own Cypress House style sheet for cookbooks runs 16 pages. Are you writing out teaspoons? Are you using a small T period? Are you using TSP period? And on and on. If you're writing an historical book, how are you treating um, um, acronyms? How are you treating dates? What is your style manual? Here at Cypress House, we use the Chicago Manual of Style. If you're writing a master's thesis or a PhD thesis, you might be using the APA Manual of Style, which treats things differently. Are you using serial commas or not? Did you garner permission for quoted text and images? This is hugely important. If you're working on a nonfiction book and you're using quoted material, I would encourage you to, to at least copy down the title and copyright page and the page of the, the text from which you are quoting so that you maintain orderly files and then when you get to a certain point in your book you can decide, okay, I'm going to drop this quote, I'm going to paraphrase this one, I'm going to, to request permission for this one, these six requests for permission are all going to Random House, this one is from a newsletter, it's going to take me a while to find. Um, if you need more information about copyright and permissions, NOLO Press has um, some wonderful books. One's called Getting Permission. They also have one that's on um, public domain, and these are huge, wonderful tools. 
um, IBPA, Independent Book Publishers Association, has some great resources and articles in their newsletter. Ivan Hoffman is a wonderful intellectual property rights attorney with a great site and hundreds of articles for authors and publishers. When you're putting together your book, make sure your chapter names are clear and compelling if you're not just using numbers. Make sure that they're reasonably the same length. Um, rhythm and flow work in typography, not just in storytelling. If you have 10 chapters and seven of them are three-word chapter titles and the other three have 11 words and 16 words and 22 words, that can mess with your design. Do all of your chapters start with a date, with an epigraph, with a quote, with a picture, with a whatever it is. Make sure that you look at the rhythm and flow of the book throughout. Make sure that your copyright page has accurate contact information. You might decide whether you want to have a Library of Congress number, cataloging and publication data block. Is your front matter appropriate? Is it in the right order? Did you spell forward right? And not forward as in onward Christian soldiers, but F-O-R-E-W-O-R-D. And I can't tell you how sad it was when someone handed me a copy of, of the book for which they had written the foreword. And because they were famous, it was on the front cover of a hardcover book published by a major publisher, and foreword was spelled wrong. So the more eyes, the better. Is your pagination correct? Are you using Roman numerals for your front matter and Arabic numerals for the rest? Are you using curly quotes, not inch marks? And the same for your apostrophes? Are you using appropriate size paragraph indents? Please don't use tabs. Those are too large. Half an inch is too much. Educate yourself about typography if you are handling this yourself or if you are guiding a, a someone who is not a trained graphic designer or typographer. There is a clear relationship between font size, font style, and line length for readability. Please don't typeset your book in Comic Sans or use too much of a script font or have huge swaths of text that are in italics. The ideal is that your book, when someone sees that on the page or in the e-reader, that it is a seamless bridge from your mind to their mind. We don't them, want them wondering, why is that bold? Why does she use so much bold? Why, why are my eyes tired? You want to keep complete that circuit as seamlessly as possible. Make sure your title and subtitle are really clear. Uh, make sure that your, your title is not just clear but evocative and certainly not embarrassing. One, one of the, the most sad titles I've ever seen was, was Mental Illness for Caregivers. And I'm sure that's not what the publisher meant, but um, it was very sad. Obviously, nobody with a marketing hat had looked at it. Is your cover compelling? If you've written a novel, please don't try to put all of your cast of characters on the cover. Please don't let the cover be designed, designed by your 12-year-old cousin. Um, if you would let, there is a wonderful TED Talk by Chip Kidd who was the designer for Knopf for many years. Um, he did the Jurassic Park cover, among many others, and his TED Talk on covers is absolutely one of the best around. Does your book have the ISBN barcode and a human-readable price? We suggest the human-readable price by the barcode because if the book goes outside the country, say to Canada, and a Canadian bookstore wants to sticker the book, it's easier for them to sticker it all in one piece rather than do two stickers. Does it have its BISAC category? Is the cover copy compelling? And it, does the cover copy give away enough but not too much? So this, this next slide here shows the back cover of a children's book we published recently. So this one has all of its fingers and toes. It has an endorsement. It has descriptive copy. It has an example of one of the illustrations inside. It has the barcode, the human readable price, the name of the press. You, as you can see, one can keep it simple. 
next year. But That's really beautiful. That's a really beautiful example. Thank you. It's one of my favorite children's books. Then, so when you walk into a bookstore, book you need to understand the dailiness of their lives. So it's great to make a connection with your local bookstore, but understand that when you walk into that store with your book in hand, wanting them to buy it, you are in a different role from when you walked into that store last week looking for a new novel by Margaret Maron. You are a petitioner, not a customer. And you need to understand the dailiness of their lives. Booksellers usually want to work with their local regional authors, but um, in a recent interview I did with a California bookseller who is one of the best stores in San Francisco, he said, look, I have 18 hours of worth of work to do to every day and eight hours to do it in. And a big part of my work is when customers walk in and a third of them want help. And then we gift wrap too. So in the course of the day, we assess what was sold the previous day, we put we put up our list to, for reorders, we unpack deliveries, get those on the shelf, deal with customers. So you're dancing around and figuring out how to cope with this huge list. And then someone comes in and they want to sell you a book. Best to make an appointment and to really be prepared. So know that, that they're going to like hearing Ingr that the book is available from Ingram. Um, I'm assuming that you have a quality product with a great title and a subtitle and you know exactly where it should be. So, Because they, these folks, when they buy from a large publisher, they probably sit down twice a year, say with a random house rep, and they might spend three hours going through a catalog or four hours going through a catalog. So they'll buy from wholesalers in what's called a cascade. So that's in order of preference. So they might start with Ingram, Whatever Ingram doesn't have, maybe they'll order from Baker and Taylor. Whatever Baker and Taylor doesn't have, they might order from Partners West. Then they would go direct to a publisher, and outside of that, that title's just not going to get bought because it's too much work to find. So findability, having your book on Ingram, is really going to help you out. If you are a local regional author, sometimes they'll want to start out buying from you on a consignment basis. It might just be easier for them. That's one reason they're called independent bookstores. They each work in a different way. If you want to do an event, go to the bookstore's website and browse around. Look at how they work with authors. They might have their consignment policy written up on their website. They might have their events. They might have all kinds of wonderful information for you to help out um, when you do your first presentation to them. So I think we have a little, uh, there's a little quiz here, and there's a prize. So if you all remember how many years Ingram has been in business, I think, um, I think you just type it in. Is that right, Robin? So what we're going to have you do is the um, first 10 people to send in a question to the question answer box to the, quest to the answer, how long has Ingram been in business, will get a special prize. And Cynthia, if you want to explain that. Well, for the first 10 people, I would be happy to give you a free 15-minute consultation on any aspect of working with your book, whether it's editorial, production, cover design, printing, printing specifications, marketing, promotion, trade shows, specialty shows, author events. You pick the subject and you have 15 minutes. OK, so we can then add. OK, one second. We are going to give you the top 10, or the first 10 answers. One second. OK. And did so, we get any questions in online from that we should answer we, now? Well, we got a whole host of questions, uh, Cynthia. So I think what might be a little more expedient is to uh, we'll gather the questions together. Uh, we'll um, kind of put them, uh, answer them, send them around to you, and then we'll post it to the entire 
list okay. so that Terrific. everybody right. has the, all the questions and the answers together. So we'll do that in a day or two when we follow up uh, on the webinar. Okay. Um, could I just add, add something about eBooks and independent stores? Is sure. It Go ahead. Okay. So Kobo is another kind of, of an e-reader similar to um, Nook and Kindle or um, an iPad or an iReader. Kobo comes out of the independent bookstore market, and they're in partnership um, with Ingram and independent stores. So I would encourage you, if you're doing eBooks, to also make sure that your eBook goes into Kobo as well. It is um, one way of helping level the playing field between the independent stores and the chain stores and Amazon. So it's a way that you can help support your local store. Every ebook that is sold via Kobo, um, a little bit of change goes back to that to that member store. And um, so I think it's been well, that's a wonderful really great. partnership. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, yeah we just had um, a, a special promotion that we did uh, with Ingram, Kobo, and Southwest Airlines. So they picked a couple of uh, eBooks out of the Spark list, and they're now making um, those two titles available to Southwest uh, travelers to read while they're traveling. And if they want to purchase the book, uh, they can purchase at the end of their flight. So. That's Terrific. something that we just did this past week, and we're really excited about that. Terrific. Yeah, because okay. I'd like to see more more um, uh, visibility for, for Kobo and for, and for the independent Oh, stores. I do too. Yep. I, I'm so glad you brought them up. Okay, so we do have our first – are the first 10 people to respond to our, our little quiz. What was the answer? Uh, the answer is 50 years. <laughs> so um, the first 10 people to respond, I'm very sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Um, it is Amber Drager, Julie Richman, Jennifer Camo, Tina Tatum, uh, Cecil Price, Peter Stanzel, Sheila Bodie, Eric Rush, Lyle Nicholson and Martha Ritter. So if we just listed your names, um, please send us um, another question with your email and we'll be sure to get you in contact with Cynthia. We'll also send out that list of winners again when we answer out all the questions. So if you, if you feel like you missed your name or anything, we'll send out that list um, at the, after this webinar as well. Great. Um, Great. Yeah, so on Alice's last slide, you will see um, our website, Cynthia's website, Cynthia's email, our support email. So if you have any questions, again, we will be collecting all the questions you submitted during today's webinar, um, and we'll get back to you if we don't know anything more specific. Um, and then, but we definitely encourage you to reach out at any point. Um, we'd love hearing from you, and um, we hope that you enjoy today's webinar. And I, and I really want to uh, extend uh, my warmest thanks to Cynthia. I just, uh, we have a, uh, you can't see us here at Ingram, but we have a great, good group of uh, some folks in the marketing department that are gathered around. And just listening to you, uh, Cynthia, I think uh, everybody in the room just uh, is is really overwhelmed with your graciousness and your knowledge. And oh, well, so thank we you. really... We really so appreciate your uh, taking your time today to, to kind of educate us as well as our, our uh, customers. All right. Well, it's but, just dipping the toe in the waters. There's so much out there as far as marketing and promotion and other kinds of visibility. So I was delighted to hear that you folks are continuing with the, with the series. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. thank you, everyone, for joining us. And again, if you missed this, we will send out a recorded version after the fact. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.